Hello and welcome to part two of Monroe Publications special presentation on Pearl Harbor 2022. For those of you who saw our part one that we released on the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, I hope you will agree with me that Pearl Harbor part two has some special guests that have made it worth the wait. First thing I want to do, though, is I want to reach back into the audio archive of veterans who were survivors of Pearl Harbor, who were there on that day, December 7th, at the Naval Base and at Kaneohe Bay, as well as those uh, two individuals who were in the Philippines at the same time when the Japanese attack was occurring there. And I want to really take you through the first part of the day from the initial shock of the uh, attack by Japanese planes, the first wave, and some of the things that happen in various places during that terrifying, uh, dramatic, and devastating period of several hours that happened in and around uh, the bases on Oahu, and then later in the day in the Philippines. So it's interesting that uh, I think, and I'll discuss this a little bit later more, that the Japanese uh, strategy for the attack was brilliant in some aspects and flawed in others. One of the things that I think was very smart was one of their first targets, and that was going after the Kaneohe Bay uh, Naval Air Station on Oahu, and that was the major seaplane base for the Navy in Pearl Harbor. Now, the Japanese, they were very familiar with seaplanes, with the uh, planes that would land in the water, uh, and they were used a lot for search, and the Japanese reasoned that if they could destroy the seaplanes, their carrier force, the one that attacked Pearl Harbor, would be harder to track because the seaplanes would be grounded, would not be able to locate them immediately and perhaps launch a counterattack. So in that regard, that was a brilliant piece of uh, their strategy. There's some other parts that I think uh, I question a little bit more personally through the research I've done and the people I've talked to, and I'll mention them later. But I mention this now because I want to start with uh, talking about what happened at Kaneohe Bay. We heard in part one a little bit from John Finn, the Medal of Honor recipient, the hero who manned a machine gun and started uh, uh, doing his own really counterattack, his own one-man counterattack on the attacking planes. Here's the perspective of another individual who was there, a Marine, Jim Evans, who was part of the Marine Guard at Kaneohe Bay. And in audio, we'll hear his reaction to the beginning of the attack there at the base. In those days, you kept your rifle with you all the time. You was issued a rifle, and you carried that sucker. To, you stayed in it for 40 years. But anyway, we had our rifle. We got the uh, quartermaster corporal to open the thing and give us ammunition. And then the fun started because we got to break the windows in the barracks. And they got to shoot out at these planes flying by. Because what they would do when they would come down and make a pass on the on the seaplane ramp, and they'd come around and come around the barracks. Anyway, I got to think, geez, we got a machine gun. So let's get the machine gun. We'll take it up on the roof. So now we went up the second deck, and they went up a ladder to the patch. And it was locked, of course. I got to go. Bust a, bust a lock with my bayonet. The hatch opened, stuck my head out, and as I did, here's a plane coming around. I mean, you know, you, you think you could touch him, you couldn't, it was too far away. But, but here he comes around, and that sucker's grinning at me, and I'm cussing at him. And I decided he was Japanese. We had no idea, no, no, no clue as to why all of this was there. Not, you know, uh, say chaos, Reign supreme with, you know, it's hardly, it's hardly touching on it. But anyway, we started humping that machine gun out. What's the matter? We don't have any ammunition. Moving over now to Pearl Harbor Naval Base itself, and specifically to Battleship Row. These were the uh, quays uh, along and around the island, uh, Fort Island in the middle of the bay, and that was, of course, a naval air station. But this is where the big battleships were uh, were stationed, 
they were uh, there in moorings around the uh, the sides of the uh, island, most of them what was called Battleship Row, which was on the southeast side. Interestingly, and we're going to hear first from a uh, survivor, a veteran who encountered that, was what happened on the USS Utah, which was a battleship in earlier times, but it became a target ship. So whether the Japanese, um, in their haste, failed to note that the Utah was no longer an active battleship, or they had other reasons, they attacked it too. Besides the active uh, battleships that were mostly on the other side of the island. So again, first we're going to hear from Bob Rufato about what happened in those early uh, seconds, those first attack uh, attacks of the first wave at his location on the USS Utah. We heard some explosions in the distance. And I, I told Glenn Schaefer, I said, it's kind of odd for the Army to be practicing with their short guns on Sunday. And about that time, we heard a real loud explosion not too far from our ship when this uh, dive bomber got the bomb on a naval air station. We were only about a quarter of a mile away from that at that time. So as I looked out the portal to see what was going on, the Japanese dive bomb was just peeling off and I could see that big old red ball on its wing. So we knew right then that we were in trouble. Well, then they sounded bombing quarters. Well, most ships have battle stations. Well, bombing quarters was everybody went to the third deck. So we went to the third deck. But on the second deck, there were people coming out of the third deck and out of the engine room because we were hit by two torpedoes. So then we went up on the main deck, and after they dropped their bombs and the airplanes would circle Fort Island, machine gunning everybody in the water and still aboard ship until they ran out of ammunition. And to get away from the machine guns, we went underneath the forecastle where the yeoman's office was. And we hid in there to get away from the machine guns. But then when the furniture started sliding across the deck, we knew we had to get off that ship because she was going over. One line, that forward line, was still intact and it broke as we were going to go down it hand over hand, but it broke about that time. So we had to walk back to the uh, stern of the ship and by that time the ship had, it capsized very slowly. So we were able to actually walk down the side of the ship and dive in the water as she was capsized. The ones that went off the port side, went off the ship then, and all that lumber and stuff we had stacked on the stern fell on top of them. Some of them were killed. There was a motor launch there tied up to the quay where we were tied up. And uh, so I swam over to it and figured, well, I'd start it up and pick up the guys in the water. But unfortunately, they had the engine aboard ship being overhauled. So Glenn Schaefer, he, he, he showed up about that time. I helped him aboard the motor launch and uh, we threw out what life jackets we had to the fellows in the water. A lot of them screaming, I can't swim, I can't swim, which we found very unusual that you would be in the Navy and not being able to swim. Unfortunately, we lost three 18-year-old kids between the ship and the shore, which is about 50 yards, because they couldn't dive under the water as I could and hang on to the coral. You could hear the bullets hitting the water above your head. They couldn't do this, so they were killed. Moving to the other side of Port Island, and this map shows pretty well the pairs of battleships lined up along Battleship Row. The Maryland, the Tennessee, the California, Nevada, Arizona, of course, along with the West Virginia and Oklahoma. We're going to start with uh, hearing from Stu Headley, who was aboard the USS West Virginia, one of the battleships being, of course, on the outside, away from the island, that was hit by torpedoes. And what he experienced in, again, those early parts of the attack, both the torpedoes from the Japanese torpedo bombers, as well as what bombers were doing at the same time. Within three to five minutes after the Arizona was hit, why we took a direct hit on the left gun, they dropped it from a high-level bomber, and the armor-piercing shell hit the wing of our SO2 scout observation plane, which is the gas tank. So that exploded, and the SO2 just burnt to a crisp. 
But on the catapult was also the admiral's plane, which is known as the kingfish. It blew that off from the catapult, split the catapult in half, and then penetrated the five inches of steel and came down inside the turret. And even though the shell did not explode, it hit the recoil cylinder, which is on top of the gun. Being in my position as a gun pointer, my feet would normally be out on a platform. And I would bend over and crank in the dials so that the arrows would be pointing right at one another. That's when I would be given the order to fire. Well, crawls in the same way, only our feet were back up underneath us. And when the explosion took place in the left gun, the real explosion came from when the shell hit the recoil cylinder. Now the recoil cylinder is filled with glycerin, so that when you fire that 16-inch gun, you want it to come back right to lo ready load. And that glycerin flash fired, killing all, I believe there were 12 men that were killed in the left gun, but it blew that hatch right past my legs, underneath the elevating screw, past Cross's legs, and hit against the barbette. It simultaneously picked both of us up and threw us back eight feet where the elevating screw came out of the deck. Well, we picked ourselves up off the deck and Cross says, let's get out of here. And he didn't say it quite that nice. When we got out on topside and we were standing there, we heard a weak voice from the bridge, and it was our commanding officer. We did not know that he was mortally wounded, but the last words he ever uttered, abandon ship, she's no longer any good to us. And little did we know what had happened to him. Because see, the commanding officer's battle station is the conning tower. He came out of the conning tower, walked around the, to the port of the starboard side of the flying deck and an armor piercing shell hit the corner of the turret 2 on the Tennessee and the shrapnel flew up and tore his stomach completely out. Dory Miller who was his uh, orderly was going to try to get him down to sick bay because he didn't realize how badly wounded he and when he died right there on the bridge Old Dory Miller, he was furious, and he grabbed a machine gun and started shooting at planes as they went by. And now we move over to USS Oklahoma, which was moored again on the outside, away from the island, and was also hit by torpedoes and, of course, eventually rolled completely over. We're going to hear from two veterans who were aboard that. The first is Don Lester. He was one of the ones who was able to escape the destruction of the Oklahoma during the attack. By the time we got to the main deck, water was shipping in the hatch, which means it was at least 10 to 10 feet past center line rolling. It's rolling fast. And the only thought that came into my mind at this time was to get as far away from her as I could because. Uh, I wanted to make sure I wasn't under the, caught in the structure of the ship. When I hit the water and started swimming, I got caught in the downdraft of the ship. She went, she, she went on over. That was the craziest feeling you ever could get a hold of. I couldn't swim out of it as hard as I tried. It was pulling me straight down. My hair was straight up in the air. I could feel it pulling me. And I went down to a point to where I felt like mud on the bottom. That's about 35 foot of water there. I went in this, I think it was mud up to around my knees. As soon as I hit, the ship hit the bottom, she had a blowback. I come back up and it was just all, all my hair just reversed, and it was down in my face now, and said, I'm coming up. And I shot out the water up around my waist. Very fortunate because it, uh, there's a lot of debris stuff in the water from the ships. 
first thing I noticed was was my chest was very sore, and I figured the, the, the water had caused me, my lungs were, were emptied out, I guess. And I was having a trouble, and there was a group of guys in this one area pretty close to me, and I got over to them and found out they was hanging on to the pontoons on the plane. The sea, we had seaplanes on the Oklahoma. They had broke loose, and we was in the water. And it was upside down, and they was hanging on the pontoons. And now from James Bounds. He actually volunteered to do some cleanup that Sunday morning in the after steerage compartment, which was, of course, down near where the screws uh, left the boat. It was a very uh, inaccessible area, and he and others were trapped in there. He talks about the first terrifying uh, minutes of that when the ship actually started to roll and being trapped in there. Of course, later he and others were rescued from the Oklahoma. Um, they endured their uh, situation being trapped in that area uh, for a number of hours until they were cut out through the uh, through the underside of the uh, of the battleship. We got hit by three rapid torpedoes, and it really shook the ship. It seemed like the ship raised up and it sort of settled back down. Then it sort of started turning the port. The lights went out. We had one light down there, and that was the first class electrician mate. He was assigned to have the steering for General Porter. But anyway, when the lights went out and the ship started turning the port, and all this stuff began to break loose, so I put my hand on the bunk and locker there way on the port side and I was going to run to the starboard side and I put my hand up there and my thumb got caught between the bunk and the locker and hey I really stretched that before I could get it out. It took two men to put them lockers up and I moved it with my left hand so you can imagine what a guy can do when he has to. I'd like to take this opportunity to mention that uh, more of the stories of Stu Headley, of Don Lester, uh, James Bounds, Bob Rufato, and many other veterans of those battleships on Battleships Row, including those who are on Nevada, Tennessee, and Arizona, are available in the uh, War Stories World War II firsthand, the Pacific Volume 1, in which we go into more detail about some of these survivors' experiences. One of the battleships at Pearl Harbor was not along Battleship Row, and that was the flagship of the fleet, USS Pennsylvania. It was undergoing repairs in dry dock. And that's where Bud Taylor was stationed on the morning of the attack. My battle station then was on the 50 caliber, on the foremost, on the starboard side. And uh, it's just right above the bridge. All we had target, yeah. They'd, well, the targets come in from every which way. Made their final swarm while they just like a bunch, like a hive of bees come in saw her on the port bow, and he right by a heck he was, it didn't seem like a wing one far to feel hard as that wall over our front we come and he made this circle. Well, we picked him up. And I can see his Japanese right now, sort of raised up in that rear seat back there and had this machine gun here, touch it that. And uh, after the battle was over, it was cleaning up all this brass we had on the deck. And I found this uh, bullet, this mass, and I said, yeah, I thought. I got to look at, and it hit a uh, superstructure right, right above my head. Also in dry dock adjacent to the Pennsylvania were two destroyers located side by side in that dry dock, USS Caston and USS Downs. Joseph Kaka was on USS Caston at the time this attack occurred, primarily, of course, because it was a dry dock. It was an attack by dive bombers and fighters strafing, and he talks about his experience during that time. And then when the ship was hit, <laughs> we just rolled off of the thing we was on and we fell to the side and we all ran down and we got off of the ship down in dry dock and uh, then we ran out of the dry dock. As we were running out of the dry dock, they, they, were, they were machining us. So what we were doing, there was a warehouse over there on the other side 
and they had uh, for loading docks they had out of, out of cement because so always going over to take uh, cover and as we're running the machine gun the hell of us yeah then they went they had the, the, like a receiving for all the people didn't have any place to go mm -hmm. and then we went there and, and it, we stayed there with them and we stayed there and they took care of us and then they said any time they had destroyers come in or some other ships you you people are going to go on so I ended up on going on the destroyer that brought the carrier in. Through a pretty thorough research on what happened at Pearl Harbor, including some very good works uh, dedicated specifically to the attack, including At Dawn We Slept by Gordon Prang and others, we'll list them in our uh, suggested reading that goes with these video presentations. And through talking to the survivors and through my own conclusions drawn from what I learned from all this information. I find it interesting that the Japanese wanted to concentrate on the American battleships. And while the Japanese did concentrate on the air assets, the airfields of Oahu, both Army Air Corps, Navy, and even Marine Corps, they ignored some vital, what we would consider uh, vital targets in Pearl Harbor itself. They didn't attack the submarine base, they didn't attack the oil field where the fuel was kept. They seemed unconcerned that the American carriers were out of port, in fact, delivering planes to other American assets around the Pacific to guard against uh, the very type of attack that they feared might come with the aggression that uh, Japan was showing. So why is it that the battleships seem so important? So important that even USS Pennsylvania in dry dock and USS Utah, which had been turned into a target ship with no armament. Why did they concentrate on the battleships at Pearl Harbor? My own personal conclusion is that uh, Admiral Yamamoto and others in the, uh, in the naval fleet, who were very familiar with America, most of them having been there, that they saw that the American public and the American military viewed the battleships as the pride, as the strength of the American fleet, not realizing that America, just as Japan, was moving increasingly towards the idea the wars of the future would feature naval aviation. Let's leave Pearl Harbor and Oahu for a minute and go across the Pacific to the Philippines. As I mentioned in part one, the attacks were nearly simultaneous on the uh, assets, American military assets in Hawaii, on Wake Island, and in the Philippines, primarily on Luzon, where America had major bases at Clark Field and Fort Stotzenberg in central Luzon, at Subic Bay on the west coast of the Philippines, China Sea, and around Manila in Cavite Navy Yard and Nichols Airfield, which, by the way, is... Uh, the modern Manila International Airport. So uh, early in the morning of the uh, Monday, December 8th, because of the time difference, the uh, high command in the Philippines, led by General MacArthur, learned of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And steps were taken then to mobilize the military over there. In the Central Highlands, uh, Fort Stotzenberg, uh, there were several tank battalions recently arrived uh, in the Philippines, and Les Tenney of Chicago was a radio operator in one of those battalions on one of the uh, tanks in a, uh, a group of tanks there that were in the Fort Stotzenberg area base there. He tells a little bit about the, uh, the attack there, which again occurred later in the day because it was, again, the time difference. And it occurred, of course, slightly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. That morning at about 5.30 in the morning, they brought our tanks around Clark Field. Fort Stotzenberg and Clark Field were together. And so they took our tanks from Fort Stotzenberg, where we were stationed, and they had us surround the field expecting paratroopers. And of course, at 12.30 that day, when the Japanese came down, we were right there as the bombs started to fall. 
and then the Japanese Zeros came in and started to strafe. And it was all hell. I mean, the airplanes went up in smoke, we had no planes left, the buildings were all destroyed, the tents were all destroyed, everything in Fort Stotzenberg was destroyed at the same time. And so uh, two hours later, when the, when the Japanese uh, bombers left and the Zeros left, uh, we started to count up our dead. That was the first day of the war. Also at Fort Stotzenberg was the 26th Cavalry Philippine Scouts, the elite group of the Philippine Scouts. They were Filipino enlisted personnel that were led by American officers. And the 26th Cavalry was the elite group of the Philippine Scouts. It was a mounted cavalry unit. Lieutenant Ed Ramsey, I mentioned him in part one. Second lieutenant at that time, only been in the Philippines for about six months. And he was charged with uh, leading his platoon in the early attack, uh, the defense against the early attack of the Japanese on December 8th. He tells a little bit about waking up to the news of the attack that was uh, happening in Hawaii and that America was at war. I went to the headquarters of the regiment and uh, everybody was scurrying around. What's going on? We're at war, don't you know? I said, no, I don't know anything about it. So I had to run back to my quarters and uh, grab a duffel bag for a war bag because I didn't even have one prepared. Then I scooted back over to the regiment. Colonel Pierce was giving the orders to the officers of the regiment. I was told at the time, well, Ramsey, you, you take your platoon, you will go to take command and control of the area towards Belair Bay of the east coast. As with those I interviewed who were attached to ships and units in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor and other bases, I also, of course, interviewed many of those who were in the Philippines at the outset of the attack there, first the aerial attack and then the Japanese landing. Once again, many of their stories and the actions surrounding what happened is in the Pacific Volume 1 from Pearl Harbor to Guadalcanal in the War Stories World War II firsthand series. I want to end this segment by going back to what I had indicated earlier about what happened at Pearl Harbor and the concentration on the battleships and really uh, the Japanese almost ignoring some of the other assets. If we say that American pride was in the battle wagon fleet, and that is something the Japanese may have picked up on, particularly with their, uh, their very uh, close relationship with uh, what was happening in America, many of them having been there. Why might they have picked that um, as, a, as a point of attack? Well, I have several ideas, and I'd like to hear from you. And if you want to put in your comments what you think about these theories or other theories of why Admiral Yamamoto, who designed the attack, and others in the Japanese Imperial Naval Command and the uh, Imperial General Command decided they should focus on the battleships at Pearl Harbor. So here's one idea, and that would be Japanese arrogance. Japan, of course, was known for not only its uh, accelerated military development in the 20th century, the early part of the 20th century, but their attitude that they were superior to other cultures in not only military, but in other areas. But certainly in military, they considered they were more sophisticated. So perhaps they thought that America had not grasped the idea that air power was going to be the naval power of the future. Maybe they thought, well, Americans ignored our effective torpedoing, our torpedo attacks in the war with Russia in the early part of the century. Perhaps they would ignore our advanced technology and strategy and when it came to the air war. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is what was Admiral Yamamoto thinking himself? Okay, it's been documented that he knew that they could only succeed, the Japanese that is, against America in a short war. So here's two alternate ideas about why he might have said prioritize the battleships. Idea number one, he thought that if we attacked 
what again the Japanese perception was was our uh, our power, our strength, the battleship, the battle wagon fleet, and we destroyed it that it would make uh, U.S. morale so low that we would be willing to come to a negotiated peace with Japan very early in the uh, after the attack, allowing them to pursue their ideas in uh, Southeast Asia and China without American interference. So that's one idea. Here's another idea that may have run through Yamamoto's head, because after all, we don't really know that Yamamoto was on board with Japanese victory. Perhaps he thought, and this is in fact what happened, that the attack at Pearl Harbor was going to be such a rallying point that it would bring America full force into the war and ultimately into American victory. We'll never know because he was killed uh, the next year in an attack by American planes. So we really don't know what his ultimate thinking was. And I doubt if he revealed it to anyone, even within his own uh, private circle of trusted commanders and trusted associates there uh, in the combined fleet. It's an interesting point. I'd like to hear what you say. Please comment about this or anything else that you saw or heard in segment one. And we'll be right back with a special surprise guest. At Monroe Publications, we like to say history is an open browser window. Open MonroePublications.com in your browser and explore our many excellent history offerings for all media. Now featuring bundled the Pacific Volume 1 and the Pacific Volume 2 at a special price. Monroe Publications. History, Nostalgia, Entertainment. Welcome, everyone. We are so pleased in our second YouTube special presentation on Pearl Harbor on the 81st anniversary to be joined by the historian from Pearl Harbor National Memorial. He has been associated with that position for many years, but actually started his National Park Service career back in 1979 at the, uh, what was then the Custer Battlefield now is the Little Bighorn National Memorial. I am so pleased to be joined by Daniel Martinez, talk, talking to us from Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on this uh, great December day. We have an exciting program. And so again, uh, pleased and honored to have Daniel be part of it. So welcome, Daniel. Thank you, Aloha from Hawaii. And I'm sitting in my office that's part of Building 416 which was built at the turn of the century, the last century that is. And, uh, and it was an ammunition storage building. And right outside my windows is the submarine base. And not far from that, the, you can see the second floor of Admiral Kimmel's office on that fateful day of 7 December, 1941. I would like to ask you, of course, uh, many in our audience already know very well about the history of what happened on December 7th and December 8th in the Philippines, Wake Island. And we have a number of publications and other uh, things that we do uh, along with some other great works to uh, get them educated, but there's nothing like visiting the site. So I wanna ask you more about the history and the history surrounding the site itself and how that history is kept alive. So my first question is the Pearl Harbor National Memorial is the place where visitors are closest to the history of the December 7th attack, everything that led up to it and immediately following from it. What message do you see visitors taking away from the, their experience there, their visits and what significance do they get carrying away from that visit? Well, it's hard to measure that, but we certainly are set up for multiple perspectives on that. Our museum, which was done in 2010, finished. Um, myself and Scott Pulaski, who's the museum curator here and others, were part of a team to build an inclusive story, Pearl Harbor from multiple perspectives. And so when we did that, um, we brought in a number of experts from Paul Stilwell to uh, Donald Goldstein and others to help us shape that narrative. Um, 
and I was very pleased with it myself because they, they brought up ideas and uh, notions that aren't normally in a museum. So we decided to do a state of mind America and a state of mind Japan and meld them together. And so that exhibit, when you enter it, you get the idea of what's happening in the United States at the critical time of the 1940s to 41 combination of video and it, it's the social and political uh, events of that time. On the other side of that exhibit, when you go around, is the Japanese perspective. And uh, the same thing with films that are from that period. We found out that many Japanese guests were aghast uh, uh, that they had never seen any of these videos, rather than films, of newsreels from the 1930s and 40s. And we included, you know, the political uh, machinations going on in the U.S. and also in Japan. Japan went through a series of assassinations um, that was it ripped their ripped the country apart politically. The military stepped forward, and then you know you go through the Great Depression uh, with FDR, and so uh, get the heroes of Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was a hero, obviously a sports hero in the U.S., but no one realized he was a sports hero in Japan. And we have this beautiful picture that was came from the Baseball Hall of Fame of Babe Ruth with Japanese, uh, uh, you know, uh, youngsters in their uniforms, you know, baseball uniforms in Tokyo. And the caption is, these young, young boys will be the soldiers or sailors in World War II, because the picture was taken in the 1930s. So what we try to do is bring a kind of a human uh, design to the exhibit. And as we take you through the exhibit, we, we march through time to the eventful day 1941 in the first gallery and the second gallery is the attack gallery. And I can tell you one of the things that surprised me was the late prime minister of Japan uh, came to visit and he wanted specifically to see this museum. And I had the honor of taking him through and he, is, he was so impressed. He said it was very fair. And when a Japanese ambassador, or rather, uh, Prime Minister says that you can take that to a lot of weight. And so they were very impressed with it. And, you know, the relationship between the United States and Japan ever since World War II has been resolute. They're one of our closest allies in the Pacific. And, uh, and to, to note that was really important to all of us that work here. So visitors certainly, um, what we might call VIP visitors, as you mentioned, one great one. Um, taking it all in. Um, what do you see uh, with younger visitors, especially with children, uh, teenagers, when they get to visit it, do they have that same sort of sense of awe at all? Or do they just uh, not really, uh, you know, it's in their modern world, it doesn't quite uh, relate as well. How, how do you see that? I, I think that the traditional exhibits that you and I and uh, those of us are a little older uh, work uh, for that group. The younger people are in tune to, for instance, uh, we have an exhibit that is on the radar and we actually have a replica of the radar set. And you can hear Elliot Lockhart speaking about, you know, this target that's coming up. The film we have in there is just around the corner. They love that. And it is the it is super detailed. So um, I had uh, Pearl Harbor experts like Mike Winger and Bob Cressman, and, and uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the other gentleman, um, uh, Burl Burlingame, and we went into a micro detail of how the attack took place, and we had to fight for that because um, it would be the only place where they would get how how all of this. Uh, attack unfolded in the you know first and second waves and the encirclement of Oahu and we got the we f I fought very hard for this as an interpretive thing as Oahu as battlefield because people come here with this idea that it happened at Pearl Harbor singularly and it was a massive attack on Oahu and all our airfields under attack almost simultaneously. And the, you know, the whole theme of air power, naval air power is so exercised here with the Japanese uh, assault 
that um, to lose that and not to give the visitors that impression uh, was was something that we were not going to allow that to happen. We wanted to give them an idea that we had people under attack at all of these airfields and naval air stations, and they died there. So for a long time, it was they came and it just was like the Arizona, which is important, was singularly you know the the altar for that sacrifice. But we, what we were determined to do is to broaden that knowledge, bring them into an idea of a Wahoo's battlefield. And that's the interpretive theme that the park rangers and the chief interpretation uh, embrace. And I take them to the battlefield sites. That's part of their education. So we we do that in, in two tours because it's, it's, it's you, they get the idea of how massive it is because they go around the island to all these sites. So that's that's the most important thing. And, and you know, when I worked at Little Bighorn, everybody goes to Last Stand Hill. Well, that's that's not that's the end of the battle. You have to go out towards the Reno Benteen site and then look towards the Wolf Mountains and understand where the Native Americans were encamped and where the the Seventh Cavalry and all its battalions, you know, came over and uh, made their way to their eventual disaster uh, in that valley. So that's that's the idea of the inclusive story. Um. Absolutely, and uh, you brought up some many valid points there. I wanna look now, not just at the present, but a bit into the future. Now you've been involved, of course, with publications. You've been uh, integrally involved with many TV productions, museum you described and memorial sites. And I think all these things are very important uh, in trying to keep this history alive and these sacrifices known, these memories alive in the future. So my question is then, what do you see as the roles of, of published history, media, like multimedia, television, so on, museums and memorial sites and extending this history to future generations and keeping those memories alive? Well, I think that there's no end to publications. I mean, we're, we live in a really special period. Um, as I look back at, you know, Paul Stilwell and his book on the USS Arizona, um, you know, Mike Winger and, and his productions with Crestman and knowing the and meeting with the co-authors of it, Don Willie Slab, you know, knowing those individuals and having them out for a symposium. And that's one of the things that we did do is we had a lot of symposiums that there you could still see on on YouTube and things like that. But I think that the the. The, the dawn of, of, of Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, certainly literature and publications, you know, you see that in the 1960s and you see that with a book that has become a fundamental handbook for the park rangers, Day of Infamy by Walter Lord. But, you know, those that are really into it, are mandatory reading is at dawn we slept. And so what, what, what you see is now uh, challenges to the traditional history. Um, new angles on uh, uh, Japanese capability at Pearl Harbor or Midway, um, new analysis of American admirals and their role in, in, uh, in the Pacific War. And, and, you know, all of that complexity is new grist for a lot of historians. And so what I'm working on myself is, is trying to put together a comprehensive look at Tokyo Yoshikawa the Japanese naval espionage officer. They call him a spy, but okay. But he was an espionage officer here to gather information and to follow him, follow his footsteps and go to the places that he went. I did that um, recently. Um, I was very interested in the Massey case, uh, which was uh, a regrettable and and uh, singularly, uh, uh, it, it damaged the, uh, what are the, it singularly brought about an understanding that was not favorable to the Navy in their role in the Massey case because of, the, of this alleged rape and an officer involved and enlisted men involved in killing one of the local Hawaiians who was innocent. And when I read that book, I said, I do not understand what that complexity was before the war and how the war reshaped that uh, relationship. Today, unfortunately, we're back there because of the recent 
um, you know, uh, incidences that have occurred here in Hawaii um, with, uh, with the uh, uh, regrettable spill at Red, at Red Hill. Red Hill was uh, important to me uh, historically because my grandfather was a contractor up there. My family was here during the attack on Pearl Harbor. My mother was nine years old and my grandfather worked at Red Hill. So that was always part of the subject, but the sensitivity that, um, that has taken place uh, over the years is um, the military has made great strides to try to be as good a, a, a neighbor as they possibly can. And they do that in a number of ways. So, um, you know, that's when you look back at the history of, of from the 1920s on, um, that relationship to the military is a very unique here in Hawaii, not only with the Navy, but with the Army as well. And that stretches all the way th through Vietnam, uh, which where the 25th Infantry was out of Schofield Barracks and still is. So, you know, that's, that's part of the history here that, um, that I have worked with and, and still try to understand. Yes, and of course you bring up a great point because um, there was the tremendous uh, number of Japanese residents in Hawaii in 1940 right. and before. Uh, they are certainly part of the story. And uh, as you mentioned to me off air, uh, there are now a great, uh, great efforts and you are certainly involved in them in bringing the Japanese uh, back into the story not just with the museums, as you mentioned, but with the ceremonies and really recognizing that uh, they, were, uh, they were on uh, different sides of the conflict when it began. Uh, they were not mm -hmm. all unified in, in one view and, and uh, the things that need to be done to repair those relationships, those pre-war relationships, those uh, post-war relationships and, and make them whole and valid for today. You brought up some very valid things are being done. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, the recent efforts to make that all work better. Well, we have had a ceremony for the last, oh, 15 years uh, with called the Black and Canteen. And this canteen was retrieved uh, in Shizuoka, Japan, after a bombing raid in which a B-29 collided with another B-29 and fell into the city. And uh, a local Japanese um, citizen uh, found this canteen in the wreckage and um, also did something that his neighbors didn't appreciate. He gave them burials. And so he was kind of ostracized for doing that, but he didn't care. And the canteen became this relic that was passed on. And eventually um, Dr. Sugano, who is uh, out of Shizuoka, same place where Tamiya Models is built, to, you know, their company is there and brings this canteen and has been doing it for almost three decades um, for a special ceremony in which, uh, whiskey is in the canteen, always American whiskey, to be poured into uh, after a, a, a ceremony of some note uh, into the well of the USS Arizona Memorial. And you can see pictures of it online, the last one. And it is a healing ceremony. And we also have added to the element, uh, uh, Colonel Gary Myers, who is a retired Marine Corps, has been my uh, partner in this for a number of years. And when the, the canteen is, is poured, it's jointly by all of the officials from four stars on. It's, it's quite a, something. And it's, it's a way of making an offering even to the dead of the Arizona. Uh, and so um, that reconciliation uh, was uh, early on. And, um, and a number of Pearl Harbor survivors uh, if chose to go to that. Some don't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't an even playing field when it came to the personal experiences of the Pearl Harbor survivors. Some could do that and some couldn't. And, and that's not any criticism, that's a personal decision. But we did have a number of Pearl Harbor survivors like Dick Fisk, who's pretty famous, and Zenji Abe, they became literally brothers. They really did. And they visited each other in Japan, here in the US. And uh, that was a lot for, for Dick Fisk to do because 
he was on the USS West Virginia and he was a bugler and he saw a lot of his friends killed and wounded. And then he went to Iwo Jima and uh, lost a, a great many men in his platoon and things like that. And yet uh, he, he found the uh, personal connection to possibly meeting with a Japanese veteran. And Senjay Abe was a dive bomber pilot uh, that flew at Pearl Harbor and all of that. Anyway, to make a long story short, they became brothers. And there was a book written about that. And, uh, and I wrote, I think, part of the introduction to that. But to watch that, and in the backdrop in 1991, when President Bush came here, uh, you know, senior came here, he came here to give a speech to nearly 6,000 Pearl Harbor survivors and their families gathered at Kilo Pier. And I was there. And I was absolutely stunned at the, this speech, I have no rancor in my heart speech, in which he was the one that kicked off that reconciliation. If there was one moment that I can point to that where some of the Pearl Harbor survivors and some of the Japanese veterans could see each other in a different light and shake hands, that was monumental. And without the president's words, and I invite all of the listeners to go and to the presidential library for George Hubert Bush, that speech on December 7th, 1991 is one to read. And for those that feel uh, still strong feelings, read the speech of this president who was also a combat veteran and maybe take time to read it. Maybe it will be time to reconsider those feelings. Anyway, that kicked off the, the idea of having the Japanese at our ceremonies that if they wanted to attend, going to the Black and Canteen, having seminars and symposiums with uh, educators uh, at the University of Hawaii to bring in these veterans, both American and Japanese, to talk about that experience and talk about uh, reconciliation and talk about uh, the other part, side of it, that the wounds were too deep that I can't do that. And we had members from the 442nd and 100th Battalion, Japanese Americans here that came and spoke. And I, I just treasure those times because they're all mostly gone now. But those teachers and students were in awe. They, it was something we're not prepared for. And uh, uh, thankfully we recorded oral histories of all of that. And it, it uh, working with the University of Hawaii and, and working with professors there, uh, at the East West Center was valuable to our mission to uh, broaden the story and bring about more understanding and more nuances of what Pearl Harbor really means. We will certainly include a link uh, with this video to uh, President Bush's 1991 speech at Pearl Harbor. That will be an yeah. excellent resource, as are others. And uh, I think we we both see the opportunity with all of the things available, with all of the elements that you described, all the things are still ongoing by a number of people, um, both in Hawaii and the US mainland and in other parts of the world to keep that understanding going and to keep that memory alive. Uh, Daniel, I thank you so much for joining our audience today and, and being a great yeah. part of this. Really appreciate yeah. Well, I hope I, at some time I could get some uh, some pictures up for you of the attack sites and memorials here, and we can certainly do that and do a walkthrough of, of those, because I think that there's a lot of these that the public can't go to, but we can share that with the public. So if you invite me back, I'd be happy to do that. That's terrific. We will definitely do that. We'd love to have you as, as a regular contributor here to the Monroe Publications YouTube channel, and, and I look forward to that. And uh, okay. again, and uh, uh, have a, a nice sunny uh, December day there in Hawaii. I'm sure it'll be uh, be great for to be there. Yeah, Christmas is coming. Christmas in Hawaii is very different, and uh, and so when the temperature drops or changes, you know, about five degrees, literally we start putting on light jackets because we get get used to that. And I live up on a mountaintop. Uh, over in Makakilo, so we uh, we have that. But everybody's prepped up. Christmas is a big thing here. And I just, re one little side story before I sign off with you is that um, just before there was a huge uh, bustle and hustle for uh, sailors and officers and uh, soldiers and airmen, all of the military to get their Christmas packages off 
before uh, the 1st of December so they can make sure they got to their folks. Unfortunately, for many of those folks, that was the last uh, message. And, and uh, that, you know, just thinking about that, that those men that, and, and women that would lose their lives that day, um, that was the last memory those families would have. Very well put and um, very well described. Wonderful resources over there. Thank you so much for being a steward of them for so many years and uh, stay tuned. Uh, and we are going to have another surprise coming up for you shortly in our part two of special presentation on Pearl Harbor for 2022. At Monroe Publications, we like to say history is an open browser window. Open MonroePublications.com in your browser and explore our many excellent history offerings for all media. Now featuring the Never Surrender DVD and the Battling Bastards of Bataan graphic history comic book bundled at a special price. Monroe Publications, history, nostalgia, entertainment. On December 16th, just a few weeks ago, I had a rare and unusual experience that came as a complete surprise to me. I was able to interview then 105 year old, now 106 year old, William Munford, William Bill Munford, who went by red as a nickname earlier in his life because of his red hair. He was a gentleman who was stationed at Pearl Harbor at the time of the attack. However, he was not there. He was radio operator on a destroyer that accompanied Task Force 12, accompanied the Lexington in delivering planes to Midway. So therefore, his experience and what happened on the morning of December 7th is slightly different than others. I was lucky to attend his birthday party. He had three, really. The one on the uh, December 16th, was at the uh, residential facility where he has his own apartment and rides around in his mobile wheelchair. And it was well attended by many people, by the news media. The mayor of Clearwater, which is where this facility is located, came to greet him. He received a special uh, accommodation from the governor of Florida. And I was part of a group from the Zephyr Hills Military Museum there to talk to him and present him gifts on behalf of the museum. So it was a very nice event, but he had three parties. That was on Friday. His actual birthday, he turned 106 on Saturday, December 17th, was with family. And finally, he had a birthday party on Sunday, the 18th at his church. He was uh, very popular, very gracious, and the, uh, the reaction of everybody there was really great. It was, uh, again, well attended by many uh, well-wishers, family, friends, other people at the facility. The uh, Military Vehicle Preservation Association brought out some World War II uh, vehicles. Uh, and again, we were uh, a contingent from the Zebra Hills Military Museum there to honor him. What he had to say was very interesting. I'm going to show you a portion of his interview that talks about leading up to what happened at Pearl Harbor at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack. But he went on uh, to talk about his entire experience and it really was very enlightening. He is such a, an intelligent, gracious man with incredible recall. So we will be featuring him again in future Monroe uh, events, future video events on this channel. But for now, I just want you to sit and listen to my interview with Bill Munford, hearing what he has to say his great story about his Pearl Harbor experience. Back then, I didn't know much about the task forces, so mm -hmm. task force 12 don't mean anything to me. But you knew you were with the Lexington, is that it? Well, I was with the Lexington. Yeah. And uh, so, as we all know, um, they were dispatched a few days before the attack to deliver planes to the other bases, and that's Mid where you midway, were. Midway, midway. Yeah, to Midway. The, the, and the Enterprise, Kelly Enterprise had left a few days earlier mm -hmm. and had already delivered some Marine fighter planes to Wake Island. Mm -hmm. And they were on their way back into Pearl, and we were on our way out. 
to Midway. The Lexington was taking some Marine fighter planes to Midway. I don't know, we never went on to Midway on that trip. But uh, anyway, they, uh, a carrier never goes in port with the planes on board. They always fly ahead. So the first group from the Enterprise had already left the, the carrier and they arrived to land at Pearl Harbor doing the attack. They were not armed and they hadn't, didn't have enough fuel to go up to the carrier. So they had nothing to do but land. That's the only option. Mm -hmm. Some of them got shot down and some of them got, uh, got uh, destroyed on the ground. I understand I wasn't there. Right. That part, but that's the way I understand it. Now, were you on duty the morning of December 7th? Were you on duty in the radio room? I had just gone on duty at 8 o'clock or just a little bit before 8 or we usually, at meal time, we did, the ongoing watch would eat a little early and leave the people going off watch a little bit early. So I went on watch just before 8 o'clock. And I just sat down and just uh, a minute or two after 8 o'clock, I got that message. And I read Pearl Harbor, this is not a drill. And the reason they had this is not a drill Radio, when we were busy, we'd send some dummy messages back and forth. And we would indicate it was a dummy message, not a real message. So that's why they put that, this is not a drill. And that came in uh, over the telegraph, the telegraph line, and you decoded it? Uh, yeah, on, on, uh, it wasn't telegraph, it was, it was by air. Uh, it was transmitted from Pearl Harbor on the transmitter and then it went through the air. Right. And we picked it up. And I was one that copied the message. Yeah, it was a keyed message that came in as Morse yeah, code. On, on Morse code. Yeah. So you're the one that decoded it? Well, we back then uh, we didn't have to decode everything we did during the war. And this, this message came out in plain language. Okay. And uh, I gave the message to the, to the messenger to take to the captain. I said, take this to the captain now. If he's on the bridge, give it to him. If he's not on the bridge, don't give it to anybody else. Go down to the cabin and wake him up if he's asleep. Well, the captain was on the bridge. Yeah. So what, what happened next after after the message got delivered to the captain? What what happened on well, the ship? Well, he just passed a word on the loudspeaker that we were apparently at war. He didn't say we were at war because it hadn't been declared. Right. Uh, we were apparently at war and told him what happened. And uh, we went on a, a wartime basis. Okay. And then when did you, uh, you know, it was a, you know, a little bit of time uh, and then you got back, obviously, into about, the harbor? About four days later. Right. Three or four, I, I didn't know, I didn't keep in count at that time. Mm -hmm. what, did you, what was your reaction when you were coming back into the port? Well, I saw all that stuff that was in battleship sitting on the bottom. The Oklahoma was capsized because the Arizona was sunk. And, uh, and the airstrip had uh, planes that were destroyed on the ground, and uh, now if we had been in port down in the area we would have tied up to wood, and there wasn't much activity down there. So we would have had a good chance of not being in any action in Pearl. So glad you could join us for Pearl Harbor part two of our special 2022 presentation, the 81st anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Wake Island, the Philippines, the beginning of World War II from the American perspective. We expect to have more programs on our YouTube channel, not just on these uh, anniversaries, but at other times when we feel we have great material to share with you. And we hope that you will comment and follow along and give us your feedback 
take a look at some of the other resources that we are suggesting and just keep involved in history and in the memory of what uh, these great individuals that I've had the privilege of talking to over the years have had to say and uh, how really the period shaped their lives and continues to shape the lives of all of us in the world today. Thank you and goodbye.